Good evening. My name is Denise Williams, and I am coordinating the newly formed Fair Districts Luzerne County Chapter. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our informational session, kickoff event, Make Your Vote Count, and PA Gerrymandering. And before, while I was think, getting my opening remarks ready, I was thinking, well, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I started thinking about the Pledge of Allegiance, and I went, was going through it in my mind, and I was thinking about the words of the pledge, and I realized I have, all of a sudden, more of an appreciation for the Pledge of Allegiance when I was thinking about the words that evening. And I just kept thinking about it, and I was like, wow, wow. And it just came to me. So what I'd like to do is start with it, but I would like to ask everyone, as we say it, once we stand to say it, if we could stay, say it slowly. And I would like all of us to really think about the words as we say it. I pledge, pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to share some of my own thoughts on gerrymandering, and I'll be brief. First. It is not a Democratic or Republican issue. It is a Republican and Democratic issue. Gerrymandering affects everyone, regardless of political affiliation. It is never a good thing. It is equivalent to stacking the deck in one's favor, and that is not the Democratic way. Why do I care? Why should any of us care? Because all votes, every vote, should always matter. And that, to me, is sacred. When I first heard about Fair Districts PA and started reading their website and learning about gerrymandering in Pennsylvania, I couldn't believe that this happens. That whichever party has the numbers, power, can and will work to shift the districts in their favor. There is a big problem when political parties put their will ahead of the will of the people. Our current system, which allows party leaders to determine district lines, is a conflict of interest. And it undermines the integrity of our elections. I have no doubt that gerrymandering is one of the root causes of the current polarization in our political environment in Harrisburg and Washington today. It is time to level the playing field and create a more accurate, impartial, and transparent process for the creation of our district lines. That is what Fair Districts PA is advocating for. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dwayne Heisler. Dwayne is a speaker for Fair Districts PA. He is going to give us an overview of gerrymandering and Fair District PA's plan for redistricting reform. He is also the Pennsylvania Voter Outreach and Registration Committee co-chair. I'd like to welcome Dwayne, thank you for coming thank and your you. willingness to be here. And I'll turn it over to Dwayne now. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm looking forward to kind of exploring the materials by Fair Districts and going through their information for you and for all of us. And then I really want to get to some questions and answers um, because this, this, um, this whole thought about gerrymandering and Fair Districts, it's like an onion. You keep on peeling away at it and you discover more and more and more as you go on. And, um, and, but there is light at the 
the end of the tunnel and we'll talk about some solutions for this too because I like being able to explore those and, and see what we can actually do about it. Um, so um, with that in mind, I'm gonna jump right in and uh, go through the materials for you. This is a newer presentation, so I'm really happy to bring it to you. Um, and, uh, and many of you here I've met before, I've seen before, I know that you're, you're very interested in this topic, which is great. So, um, so let's do that. Um, so first of all, um, what the agenda is for today. So we're gonna talk about the current process of redistricting, both looking at congressional and at state legislature. We're gonna look at the problems that are caused by it, proposed changes, and what we can do to help. That's kind of the outline of, of what we're working on. So there's a few definitions that we really need to think about when we're talking about uh, gerrymandering and so one of them is reapportionment and so basically there are 435 seats in Congress and based upon our population the census it is determined then how many which states get how many legislators all right and to do that um, they have to you have to have an accurate census count and that's how they go about it so Pennsylvania the last time this was done lost one seat this time around in 2020 it's estimated that we're going to lose one, possibly two seats. Um, the last time, although Pennsylvania's growth was, was, it was growing, um, it wasn't growing as fast as some of the southern states and the western states. But this time, our population is actually shrinking in Pennsylvania. Um, and so, it looks like we might have two congressional seats. What does that mean? That means that the lines in Pennsylvania must be redrawn. There's no choice because we don't have as many seats as we once had. So that's one of the reasons why Pennsylvania, and we'll, just, we'll uncover this later, is seen as a real target for political action for regarding gerrymandering because of the, the shift in population. So, um, so we're looking at doing that. Um, and then redistricting is really setting up the boundaries for your state senate, your state house, and your, um, and your congressional district. So, um, and they're done in different ways. So uh, first of all, you know, the federal congressional districts are done um, based on population. Um, and basically, when you're looking at this, it just gets passed as a bill. So right now there's some very smart people in Washington, D.C. that know that Pennsylvania's maps are going to change. And so they're already writing the laws that they're going to hand off to Harrisburg to pass through the House, pass through the Senate, and get a signature by the governor. That's what happened in 2010, although there was a little court battle that happened, and so the lines weren't completely redrawn until 2012. There are people who are doing that. It's almost like our lines are out of our control because that's the process for drawing the congressional lines. Now, the, um, the state legislature is a little bit different. It's made up of, of a five-person commission. So you think, oh, a commission. This makes more sense. But it's a commission of politicians. So the United States is one of the only countries that allows their politicians to, draw, to decide who votes for them. Doesn't that just sound wrong? I mean, we allow our politicians to decide who gets to vote for them. Shouldn't it be the other way around? But that's really what's happening. When other people from other countries visit the capital or visit the, the, uh, the state capital even, and they figure out well, how does this work, and they hear it, they can't believe it. They can't believe that that's how it's done here, that our politicians decide who vote for them. So anyway, there's this, um, there's this commission, and you have basically, sorry, independents, two Democrats, two Republicans, right? And then they're supposed to decide who the chair will be. But of course, they could never agree. So then the court actually decides who that fifth person is on that commission. But this commission doesn't have to do anything. They can be in some back room somewhere um, and just make this decision. And so basically three people in our state get to decide what the lines look like in our state legislature, and then we have to live with it for 10 years. That's how that's done. It doesn't have to be approved, it doesn't have to be signed, that's how it happens in our state. Uh, which is just absolutely remarkable. Now there are some rules in the Pennsylvania Constitution, you can see them down here, um, that it's supposed to be composed of compact and contiguous territory. Well they are contiguous and we'll show you what some of the maps look like. In other words, everything's kind of touching. Some of them are held together just by a single street. Um, but they are contiguous, but they're certainly not compact. Um, the language in the Pennsylvania Constitution really um, is so loose that it's really hard to enforce. And it says, unless absolutely necessary 
necessary, no city or county, city, incorporated town, borough, township, or ward shall be divided um, uh, in order to create these. And when you actually look at the map, they are divided like crazy. I mean, it really just doesn't hold up. Um, so um, sadly, um, even the, the, the uh, mechanism that we have in our Constitution is not really being followed um, as it should be. So where does Jerry, so this is the third term, term then. We have reapportionment, we have redistricting, and we also have gerrymandering. So Eldridge Jerry, actually his name was Eldridge Gary, which just goes to show you that everything about gerrymandering is wrong. They can't even get the name right, right? So in the 1800s, he was the governor, and he drew this line, there it is, that's his district up there, and someone from the newspaper said, hey, it looks like a salamander, and someone else said, oh no, it's a gerrymander, and the name stuck. Even though gerrymandering was happening before that, uh, it's as old as our country is, really. Um, but that's where it comes from. He is famous for that because it looks like a salamander. That's where it comes from. Um, so there are three types of gerrymandering. So this is important because, you know, I know the first time that I heard about gerrymandering as a kid, it was just that, oh yeah, if someone's an incumbent, it's really hard to get them out of office, right? I mean, that's, that's usually the first thing that comes to mind. Once you're in office, it's hard to get you out, right? That's what you hear, right? That's kind of the talk in the street. And, um, and that really, is talking about what's known as a sweetheart deal, which was, up until a recent time, the most common form of gerrymandering. And basically, if, um, if I'm one party and you're another party, we get together and say, hey, why don't we draw the line so that you're safe and so that I'm safe and we both get to keep our jobs? Sweetheart, sounds like a great deal, right? Right? And so this is why it's so hard to get incumbents out of office because they draw the lines in that way. So in this diagram, this over here, of course, is more competitive. But over here, we got together like this, so we have one safe red district, one safe blue district, and only one that's competitive, right? So that's a sweetheart deal. So there's two other types of deals, though, and this gets even more challenging here. There's something that's called cracking. And so what cracking is, and you'll see this in a lot of um, urban areas where they try to crack the votes. And so what they'll do, is, what, what, what the lines do, is they take a, um, a demographic and they break it up. They smash it up, okay, so that it, its power is diffused. And therefore, like for in this example, the, um, the reds are cracked. No, I'm doing that wrong. The blues are cracked. I'm sorry. I'm looking at it backwards. The blues are cracked here so that the reds win two territories here. They broke up the blues right down here. They cracked them. The other type or the other form would be cramming where they push them all together. And here they crammed all the red votes together so that the other two went blue. See, it really doesn't matter how many votes. It matters how the lines are drawn. And that's, that's the tough thing, because you can draw these every single way and end up with a different result with the same number in each group. So, and you'll see this in a lot of um, um, kind of suburban areas where they're actually packing those together so that all the surrounding territories go, all the, all the surrounding areas go the other way. So those are the forms of it. And we'll actually look at some maps that kind of show you how that, how that works. Well, here's a great example, the 7th Congressional District. This is a famous one. It's one of the most gerrymandered districts in the whole country. We're known for this, thank you, Pennsylvania. This is called Donald Kicking Goofy. It's down around like Montgomery County. And you can see right here, it's held together by just this little piece right there, right? Um, when your districts start looking like cartoon characters, there's a, a, some also called this bullwinkle. Um, there's actually kind of a diagram that goes along with the horns and all that kind of stuff. So pick your character. It could be any of those things. But I don't know how you can look at something like this and say, yeah, this looks fair. Every one of these little marks, every one of these little digits that go out here is someone who's losing their voice. Every single little deviation is someone who's losing their voice. Um, so let's look at the evolution of this. It's gotten worse. This is what the district used to look like. 
And then it went crazy by 2013 as a result of the, and this is a congressional seat, as a result of the 2010 census and then the 2012 court case, we ended up with this in 2013. There's a lot of factors why it's gotten worse, too. And we'll, we'll look at some of those, too. Like, why is it even more of a problem, even more insidious right now than it was? Because, I mean, if you look at some of these, they, they don't look too bad, right? But ugh, that's, that's off the deep end right there, right? That's one of the reasons why Pennsylvania has one of the worst gerrymandered, it's one of the worst gerrymandered states. Number two, yeah, you know, I don't know what the, what the criteria is for it. Like, I don't, I don't know how they look at the statistics for things, um, but, um, but yeah, so here, look at this. This one's interesting. So look at Montgomery County. Montgomery County, and so here's, can you see Donald kicking Goofy? It's kind of the reddish, if you can make it out in there. You see how, so that's what it looks like in the context. But then look at all the craziness that's going around the, out, the other districts because of that. So it's not just that district, right? And so if you look at Montgomery County, Montgomery County has a population that could support a single congressional candidate. But it's cracked. You have what? One, two, three. Oh, that one connects over there. Four, five. You have five congressional seats there, but yet it could support one. Montgomery County doesn't have a voice. Not on a congressional level when you have a broken county like that. And there's enough of a population there. Remember that whatever happened to don't break municipal lines, right? What's happening here? I'll tell you what's a good story right here. The 16th congressional district. Look what happened. Now this comes all the way down here into Lancaster. Most of it's in this area and then comes back up into Chester County like this. Grabs Coatesville. But look at that up there. You see that? The city of Reading. It's held together by that little sliver. Reading has a story, and I think that maps tell stories as well. So Reading is a city that is known to be one of the has one of the worst school districts in the country. It is so its schools are so underfunded, and it's it's a rust kind of a rusting rust belt kind of city. It, its economic development is not very good. And if you're running for the congressional seat in the 16th congressional district, the way that you win is by ignoring Reading. Because they went around the city of Reading, then ran it all the way out into all those farms in Lancaster, and that's where the population is. They grabbed all that population. So if you're running for office, you need to get this vote right here. If you're just campaigning in Reading, you're going to lose, right? And so when it comes time to when they're deciding budgets, like for schools and things like that, Reading has no voice. It's completely cut out. Yes? Just another fact. Reading has a long history of socialist, uh, very, very progressive politics. And that's a classic example of a Yes. Take that democratic strength and you isolate it and you split it from other democratic areas. Now let's be clear, the Democrats do it too. Take a look at Maryland, how they've cracked that, how they've they, they cracked and packed and yes, and so, well California has moved to a commission, so they've, so they've kind of addressed it, but, but you're right, you know, look at, that is, that is very, quiet. That, that to me is a sin, what is happening up there, that is shameful, absolutely shameful, why, no one's saying, oh, we drew this to be fair. <laughs> right? Who's saying that? There's no way anyone could say that this is being fair. It's anything but. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's just not what a democracy in my just vision should be. One other example. The city of Philadelphia has about 1.4 million people, but the average congressional district holds about 700,000 people. It could have two distinct seats. Look how it's right. So there are um, 18 congressional seats in the state at this point in the state of Pennsylvania. There are over one million more Democrats registered in this state. Do you know how many of those 18 seats are actually Democratic? Five. Three near Philly, one in Pittsburgh, and Matt Cartwright's district that's kind of up around here, right? He's the only rural congressman in the whole state. He's not, he's he's not. Cracked. No. He is cracked. Well, he's packed. He's, he's grabbing. Has eight or nine cities. Yeah, but when you cover things like, uh, like uh, Carbon County and Schuylkill County, and they're not really big, but that's part of his district as well. So it's a mixture. It's a mixture. Um, but it's not a Philadelphia or a Pittsburgh 
Um, although Scranton, you yeah, know. Scranton, Wolfsbury, Easton, Stroudsburg, Bethlehem. Yeah, Pottsville. Pottsville. Although Pottsville has flipped, so. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so that's what you have. So you have, out of 18 seats, only five. And there were over 40,000 more votes for Democrats that year. 40,000 more votes. It's kind of rough, kind of rough. But, like I said, it, it has been on the other shoe too. It just so happens that this is what we're dealing with now, so, uh, in this district. So, so yeah, I mean, maps tell a story. Uh, and this one, it, it's pretty obvious, um, I think. And this is what's really important, I think, the more that you understand and you're working through this, is having these conversations with your legislature and, and looking at maps. You know, it, when, you're, when you're looking at a map for your region, you should know what those neighborhoods are and what they're made up of. So you can have a conversation about that, about your community. And is your voice being heard in your community or is it not? Because of the way that the lines are drawn. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Um, so let's, uh, let's continue. So why has this become more of a problem? There's a few reasons. First of all, mapping technology has really you know, uh, with every other technology has really grown. And so there's things you can do with maps now that you could never do before. I mean, you can draw them literally around someone's home, which actually happened up here. There were lines that were drawn and someone who was running for office was drawn out of his own district. And then his competitor said, hey, he's running for office, he doesn't even live here. It, they drew it around his backyard. So candidate right up here ran for office and they drew the lines in 2013, right around his house. I, I shouldn't be laughing about that, right? But because it, it's so sad, you know, about what has happened. But that's, I mean, that's what we're talking about. And before that technology just wasn't there to get those numbers to come in, right? To get those numbers to actually happen because they all have to be relatively the same size, right? Uh, for the district. So, so yeah, so the technology, but it's also not only the, the drawing of the lines, it's the other data mining that comes in. There's so much information now. You have all the information about voting habits and about shopping and who has a cat. And I mean, you could just overlay anything you want on this data to come up with, with your formula for Coca-Cola or whatever it might be to, to come up with, you know, the best drawn uh, uh, gerrymandered seat that you could possibly do. And so that has taken it really over the edge. And then the undisclosed outside money, and we'll look at some of that too. Pennsylvania is just a record breaker everywhere uh, when we look at how that outside money works. So, and like I said, this is just not one party or the other, it's both. Here's the Democratic super PAC called Advantage 2020. They were kind of asleep at the wheel on 2010 with Project Red Map, even though Karl Rove announced it in the Wall Street Journal on March 4th, 2010, that this was his plan. He said, if you want to control Congress, you need to control the state legislatures who draw the lines for Congress. Brilliant, right? And he did that. That's what happened. That's what happened in 2010. Um, so, uh, but the Democrats now are pouring all kinds of money into, into Advantage 2020, and Red Map is now going to Red Map 2020. So if you think that, I, that, that, that campaigns were crazy before, wait till you see this coming up if we don't fix it. If we don't fix it, we're gonna have tons of money coming in here with these attacks going back and forth to try and control the state legislature. There's other reasons why Pennsylvania is up on the list. And one of those reasons is the fact that we have such a large legislature. And because we have a large legislature, it's easier because it takes less money to flip each individual seat because of the way the media markets are set up. So your money is, we're telling the outside world, hey, come to Pennsylvania, your money is well spent here, we'll be able to flip a seat for you. Because of the way our rules are, because we don't have the restrictions on the money, plus because of how large our legislature is. So that's a real problem. Um, here we go. Uh, no limits on PAC donations, lobbyist donations, fundraising by outside groups. I mean, it's very large. We're ranked 43rd by the Center for Public Integrity. Here we get an F over here. Thank you. We, we have a little, <laughs> we brought in the outside diagram here. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. And let me know if you have any others of those. <laughs> so, so, that's yours? Okay, good. Thank you for bringing that. Um, you know, uh, 
we're just blazing the way, right? We're just leading, leading the pack right here. Uh, and, um, and that's one of the reasons why, why Pennsylvania is a target. The other thing is, is that we are a, um, uh, uh, with Florida, Florida's the largest one, a flip state. So, um, so we have a lot at stake here. So that's another reason why Pennsylvania, because we have so many electoral seats here. We have 20, right? Um, so, so we have a lot at stake here as well because we're, we're not a smaller state when it comes to population necessarily. We want, we're the second largest behind Florida. That's um, a potential flip state. Um, so we have the largest legislature, fewer, uh, more districts, which means fewer votes per district, which means less money, easier to flip, which is what I just said. So that's the math behind it or the logic behind why if you're looking to flip seats, you come to Pennsylvania to do it. A lot of outside influences happening here. A lot of outside influences. Not our, we're, it's almost like we're not in control of our own destiny in this state. So now, this, this information I think is fascinating. What are some of the problems that go along with this? Fewer choices in the primary. How does that work because of gerrymandering? Um, uh, often no choices in the general election, unable to vote them out. If you look at this first column, look at this in 2016, races with incumbents, okay? So not over 90% of all the races in 2016 were incumbents. They're up again, right? Over 90%. Of the, uh, are up again to vote, right? And when you look at incumbents without primary challengers, 86% of those didn't have anyone challenging them. In other words, you get them in there and there's almost no way to get them out because no one's challenging them. And look at the, one, the next one, races without any opposition. And so, once, so not only don't they have a challenger within their own party, the other party isn't even running against them. Why should I spend two million dollars on a race that I know the lines are already drawn to be on the opposite party? Why would I do that? Who would do that? Who wants to do that? No one apparently. So when you're in a race like that, you have to, you have to win your primary and the elections become about the primary. And this does a lot of different things. It polarizes. It makes you more extreme. And so if you're not following your party line, whether it's Republican or Democrat, you have to be worried because they'll primary you. That's your biggest fear, not the general election. You already have a red district or you already have a blue district. It's being primaried. If you're primaried, you're at real risk. Not the general election. It's not about the general election. It's about your primary. And so that forces us to be more extreme. Because if you're, gonna, if you're a Democrat and you're being challenged in a primary, they're going to put someone up on your left. And if you're a Republican and you're challenged in a primary, it's, you're not going to go more moderate, right? <laughs> Why would you do that in your, Republican, in your Republican district? You need to become more extreme. And so we're moving like this because of the way the lines are drawn and because it becomes a race in the primary and not the general election. Um, so here's the impact. So you're focused on winning and controlling, um, not controlling effective government. You know, and I, this is a personal belief I have. The idea that you're running every two years just seems crazy to me. You win an election, you start on the next one, right? It just seems like that that term you know, for a state legislature is just too short to me. I don't know. Now you don't have to worry about it, I guess. I don't know. Do you have to campaign? I, I, some people do, but, uh, but yeah, but it's just, it just, it almost creates, it's, it's the system that's broken, right? So you're almost forced to, to almost run around the clock. Um, Elections are decided in the primary, which we talked about, which doesn't reflect the general population. Increased polarization and gridlock. I think I hit all these things, didn't I? Greater disconnect between the general population and the elected officials, right? Because we feel, what, that our vote doesn't count, right? Do you have a, a contemporary example of this division and, why, and how our government isn't working in this state? Well, I, I think there's all kinds of examples all around yeah, us. So. Well, did you hear what just happened today? Did you, you, you know that it got out of committee today and they're supposed to be voting in, within an hour on the floor uh, on that budget, which is nasty, along party lines. 
completely along party lines is what's happening with that vote. That's just happening right now, today. Yeah. I was in Harrisburg on Monday trying to like lobby for a budget that is for people. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard of the Delaware loophole? I think since I was this tall, I heard about the Delaware loophole. Well, it's still there. Yeah. Correct, yes. But um, is Pennsylvania's population, can that be different than other states? Or is, do you oh, that? yes, it is. Each state decides how they uh, determine their, on the, not on the federal level, but on their state legislature. Yes, that's correct. You said less voters. Yeah. There are certain states that do an amazing job. If you, but then again, there are certain states that it's a little bit easier to do. Like if you look at a state like, um, like Iowa, it's very square. And they have four congressional seats. So guess what? Their districts kind of look like this, <laughs> sort of. They kind of look like that, right? And, um, and three out of four of them are competitive. So one of them is just the dynamics of, of where it is, that it's, it's not, uh, just based on the population in that grid that happened. Plus, all their counties are almost square. Well, our counties aren't that way, right? We have rivers and lakes and mountains and, and craziness, which is, which is very important because when we're actually looking at way things are drawn, geography does have a role in it too. It may not make sense to have a district like this with a mountain running through it or where the school districts are kind of split or, or however that might work because of the physical geography that's involved. So, you know, just, just leaving it up to computers to draw that, you, you still need some eyeballs on that to really make some sense out of it. If the goal is to make them more fair and representative, yeah, of, of, the, of the population. Well, so. At least you have similar growing seasons. Carlisle's tomatoes get ripe for a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> we should have tomato districts, right? And this is like watching food. You were saying? Can the commission change that? Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about how, how another, what an alternative might look like in terms of, well, in terms of having more fair districts, um, what, what, what some of those components might be, one way of looking at it. And there's a whole bunch of ways of looking at it. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that no system is going to be perfect. But goofy kicking Donald? That's pretty bad. You know, we need to do something about that. When you have 18 congressional seats and only five of them to the majority party, there's something happening there, right? Something, something that's not quite working out, right? That's not happening. Was there another hand up over? Yes. I just want, is it too early to ask about, isn't there a move afoot to reduce the number of legislators? Yes, there is. Um, I don't know where that is. It's probably in a committee somewhere. <laughs> but I, I'm, yeah, that wouldn't be a bad guess, right? Yeah, this is Pennsylvania. You said go ahead. Wasn't that at the referendum last year asked about it? Yeah, it's come up several years um, to have that happen. I don't know if it was a referendum on the, on the ballot, but well, it. Ages. Yeah, that was the, which they rewrote again because it failed, and then they kind of like... And they wrote it down because they couldn't get the wording right they needed a constitutional Yeah. So, all right, let's continue and, and hold on to those questions because I want to be sure we get through everything here um, that we want to do, but good questions, thank you. Um, so, all right, um, I think we covered all of this, so let's go on. Yeah, uh, effect on businesses, it's, it's no surprise that um, small businesses are behind drawing the lines more fairly because they feel they don't have a voice because of the, con the contributions um, that are made and basically the influence that businesses have um, on our legislators um, for whatever you know that might be. So now we'll get into how we can fix it. So this is getting to some of the, the, um, the, the questions that you have and where we were going. So let's look at this. So one of the ideas is to have an independent redistricting commission. So what would an independent redistricting commission look like? Um, and having it be completely transparent with public participation. So what would that look like? It would have to have some kind of strict timeline because you just can't have this thing going on forever, like our budget, right? Which always seems, every year we can't get things done because of the budget, right? 
and then we wonder why we can't get things done. Well, we have a budget, right? So, um, and then um, addressing other kind of unfairness that might be kind of baked in to the process that we have. And so, um, the two bills that are up there now, which it requires a change to the Pennsylvania Constitution, would be Senate Bill 22, those are the primary sponsors, but there's more, and House Bill 722, they almost have 100 on that list, completely, bar 98, a completely bipartisan um, effort that's there. So those are close. House bill, well, there's not as many people who are on the Senate bill, but that's not unusual because usually the Senate doesn't like doing things unless the House gets it through first. Um, you know, who wants to put their neck on the line? Well, maybe your legislator should, but that's another story. Um, so, um, so we have the House Bill 722, which is in committee right now. We're trying to get that moved somehow. Um, so let's look at what, what, what these proposed changes are. So the first one is, is how, if you wanted to apply for one of these commissions, what are the rules? How could you actually apply? Well, first of all, you had to have been with the same party that you've been with. In other words, hey, I'm going to get on this commission. I'm going to switch parties so I can really mess with this whole process, right? Uh-uh, not going to be allowed, right? Um, you had to vote actually too. You know, there's no sense, hey, I want to do this. Have you ever voted before? No, probably not a good choice, right? Because they haven't even participated in the system. Uh, your spouse or you can't have held elected office or been a lobbyist or a member of a legislative staff or held an elective or paid statewide office in any political party for the last five years. That one's a big one, right? To make sure that you're not influencing that from the inside because the whole idea is to not have lines drawn by our politicians, right? So why would you put politicians on that commission? Doesn't make sense. It doesn't really meet the definition of independent then, right? Um, can't seek to be, and then you can't get on there and then decide that you're gonna be a lobbyist or you know whatever it might be for the five years after. So you're kind of forfeiting that as well. Um, other components that might be good um, when you're looking at this is that the Secretary of State actually, so once you get in that pool, then the secret, which is the standard process, Secretary of State would go in and they would pick from that pool a group of four from the largest political party in the state, another group of four from the second largest, and then another group of three from all of those that are non-affiliated. So you have these three pools, right? And so with these three pools, these pools have to reflect basically the population of Pennsylvania. So if we had X percentage of men and X percentage of women, we would expect that this commission would reflect that. In other words, it's supposed to look like our state. The group selects a chair approved by at least six members. And so um, at least six members. So if you have a pool of four and a pool of four and a pool of three, you have to have some cooperation because no group could do anything by themselves. Um, but it gets even more than that. The commission would develop the procedures and acquire the software. Um, they would process the procedures for review on a public website. So you and I can go, remember the commission of five that could go off to that smoke-filled room and make decisions? Well, that wouldn't be allowed anymore. Right? It would have to be on a public website. Um, you'd have to have four hearings before the maps are even drawn to get public input on what the line should look like. So this would be our opportunity to say, hey, our school district has been so split, we need to get us together. Right? Or whatever that might be, whatever is the, is the local issue. Um, the only numbers that they would allow to be used is the census data, just the population numbers. No longer can you put all that extra data mining information in there, like which party you're affiliated with, how the votes were. None of that previous data would be allowed to be used, just the census data. Um, and then all this information would be available to the public, that they would be able to see it. That's the transparent part of it. Also, that um, when a map does, is up for consideration, it needs to be on a public website and show everyone what the commission is working on. And then have four meetings afterwards. It may be in regional areas to say, hey, we're open. here's what we're thinking about with the map. Let's have a discussion up here in Wilkes-Barre, Scranton and figure out if this is acceptable or what, what you would like to see. Do you have any issues with this? That kind of dialogue is what they're looking for. And then the final vote to approve it must contain seven votes. Remember, it's four, four, and three. And you must have one, at least one from each group. 
So the Republicans and Democrats wouldn't be able to get together and say, who cares about the independents? Because you, you would need that independent vote. Same the other way, like the, the Democrats couldn't get together with the independent and say, well, let's cut the, the Republicans out of the picture or the other way around. So it would be required that you get a vote from each of those pools in order to move it forward. It seems like what they're trying to do is certainly more than that smoke-filled room, you know, of making it, or just a bill that's passed up and down, signed by the legislature, signed by the governor, and just passed. This is a little bit more thoughtful of who's going to be making these decisions, and then how that process can be maybe looked at a little bit more fair, where they have to negotiate, where they have to work together, where they have to fee and be under the public eye, all the while that it's happening. Yes? Yes, they are. Now, there might be some modifications here and there. They're not completely and totally identical, but these are the principles that Fair Districts is, is abiding by, and they do support these two bills. So they do contain these things or, or very close to, to exactly this, you know. So um, there might be a few deviations here or there, but in, 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 in spirit, this is what it is. Well, even more so than that, in language is what it is. What would be the mechanism for breaking the gridlock? Well, there would be, remember it said it had to happen within a given time frame. They would be required to do it within a given time frame. I don't know what the consequences are. I don't know what the consequences are if it, if it goes beyond that time frame. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, I'm, I don't know that. That's something to look up. But here's the good news. Go to fairdistrictspa.com and ask your question. There's a whole team of people there that are willing. Actually, that website is excellent. You can get all kinds of information. You can even get a PowerPoint presentation like this. So if you're with a small group, you can get together and look at this. It's transparent. You know, they wouldn't be actually walking in their talk, right, if they kept all this information to themselves. So it's there for, for public use and for you to look at, for you to consider, for you to think about in terms of what we have now and, and where we're going. I have it. You have it right there. It says here, the special master would be appointed by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in the rare situation where the redistricting commission is unable to agree upon a plan. And special masters, that's what California does as well. I think they have a, a group of masters. But special masters are commonly used in many different areas of law when courts need to rely on individuals with specialized expertise to advise them. It's important to note the special master would be bound by the same rules and standards that apply to the commission to the itself, and also the special master would not act unilaterally. His plan would have to be approved by the Supreme Court before it could take effect. There is strong legal precedent for the use of special masters in redistricting and research, demonstrating that maps drawn by such court-appointed experts are consistently more fair and less likely to be contested than those drawn by partisan politicians. There we go. So there we have it. So there's a provision for that. Um, also, um, when, this, when this process happens, there's no legislative approval. It no longer has to go to the House or the Senate. It doesn't have to go to the governor for signature. Um, and then if anyone has a problem with it, they can file suit, and the courts can decide whether they're going to uh, address that or not. And, and you know, as it is with all laws, um, it gets tested that way. So, um, what is the timeline for this to happen? And I'm looking at the clock here to make sure that we stay within our timeline. Um, we want to make sure that um, something, it has to pass two consecutive sessions of our legislature. And so we're looking at the 2017, 2018, and then also the 2019, 2020, so that by 2020, it can be a referendum on our ballot for the citizens to decide, hey, is this where we want to go? And that's in place for the 2020 census, so the timeline is there. Um, yes, it's a heavy, there's Atlas, it's a heavy, is that Atlas? I don't even know. Who is it? Oh, cool, yeah, write that down, there he is. So, so it looks like he's really working hard. It looks like a heavy lift, right? Uh, so what can you do? So here's, here's where we talk about our role and what we can actually do. Obviously, you're interested in this. You want to be able to help. The first thing is to really take action is you need to talk with your legislature. You need to do that. Um, and um, go to their website and you can get the detailed points there and to help you to see what is the best way to help communicate this and make sure that you really fully understand 
what it is you're there for. Um, you can write letters to the editor, and there have been a few up here, right? And we've seen those letters to the editor. They're, they're in there all the time, which is really good because that helps with public awareness that, that this is something, you know, there, not everyone out there is as well versed, especially now, about what the process is and, and the history of gerrymandering. And so you're really the leaders in the community at this point. So, so this is up to you now to see what you're going to do with this and how you can move it forward. Um, or even through social media. So, um, you know, so make sure that that information gets out there. And then form a local group, which is what is being done here, which is fantastic, to really kind of coordinate those efforts and make sure that the public is aware that there are things you can do. And there are groups throughout the state all over the place. Um, there's a lot of groups that are coming up. Um, and so the community seems to be aware. This is, I, to me, this is one of, one of the things that we really have to get right. I think that this gets, if this gets corrected, if this gets put in the right direction, we can see all those things that we just talked about kind of move in a better direction. Maybe we won't be so beholden to our parties. Maybe independents will have a voice, right? Like we were talking about earlier. Maybe we will get districts that don't look like Donald kicking goofy. Maybe we'll actually be able to work with, we'll be able to, to vote in, at, the, at the fire hall that's right next to our house, you know? Uh, you know, I mean, there's really something, this can really have an impact. Maybe we will feel like our vote counts. And maybe it actually will. It won't be a predetermined situation with gerrymandered districts. So, um, so those are some things that you can do. Um, and fairdistrictspa.com uh, is, is there to help with that. Um, here's uh, how you can get in touch with them. Um, there's this information, and I'm sure that you, um, it's fairdistrictspa.com. You can con there's so many different ways to reach them. Um, and then here's uh, Ronald Reagan back in 1991, and he says, I believe the state should set up a bipartisan citizen commission to draw district lines. This isn't a new thought. This idea of what we're trying to do right now in Pennsylvania, this is not a new thought. This has been around for a while. And this is really important. Um, I'm the guy on the end in the plaid shirt over there that's got to kind of cut off a little bit. That's me. I'm like, yeah, there I am. Um, so um, this is, this is uh, really, this action was taken by the League of, of Women uh, Voters. Um, uh, they decided to file suit based on the current congressional lines. And um, so that's actually moving forward right now. And, and so I was at this hearing and there was an interesting question that was brought up. One of the reporters said, um, why is it these congressional lines have been around you know, for, since 2012, 2013, why are you filing suit now? Why are you doing this now when the lines were drawn back then? And um, the answer by the attorney I thought was really fascinating because what the attorney said was that um, usually when you go before a judge, they want to actually see proof, not your thought that it's gerrymandered, but actual proof. Well, we have 2014, 2016, right? You have all these years to show what's happened with the vote. And now there's a mathematical formula to show that indeed it is. This is having an, an, an impact on our elections. And so the proof is there. And so they can make the case now. Um, so that, I thought that was a fascinating question and a thought. And, and I, I thought the answer was really very well thought about why it is a good time to have that kind of thing happen um, right now. So, um, so yes, there is. Um, this suit that is having Common Cause and the League of Women Voters, uh, both nonpartisan groups came together to form fair districts um, in like January, beginning of this year. Um, and so th this is really nice to see these groups come together. And now they've been joined by all kinds of organizations throughout the state, all kinds of groups. I do a lot of speaking for rotary groups and libraries and political parties. And, and, uh, and in fact, I can tell you that just this past weekend at the uh, Pennsylvania Democratic Democratic State Committee, they just unanimously voted to support fair districts as a resolution. That just happened. So that's news right now. Uh, the, the State Democratic Party has said, you know what, we need to, we need to address this and it needs to be fair. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, and I'm not familiar with their processes, <laughs> to be honest. So, um, but at least you have some kind of resolution happening there. Um, that this is, and that's brand new, that's, that's news. So um, they actually ended up passing five resolutions. That was just one of them. Um, so 
Uh, if you'd like to talk with me about what the other ones were, because they're pretty cool, let me know. So um, here's something else. Uh, all of this doesn't happen for free. So uh, if, if one of the ways you can contribute is by making a donation, um, they would put it to good use to further this cause. Um, it's all volunteers. Um, you know, I, I volunteer, every, everyone, every instructor that goes out, it's all volunteer work. So um, that would be helpful. Um, and that's that. So I want to go into any kind of questions. We have some time for other questions, although we did some going along. Yes? Uh, do you know the language in the bills that says uh, that you have to be registered with the same party for three years to be part of that commission? Do you know if it takes into account that independents have to switch to be able to vote in primaries? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. I don't know that it does. I don't believe that it does. Um, that's something good to talk about with fair districts because that would put, that you're in a unique situation as an independent, right? Because if you want to vote in a primary, you really don't have a voice. So you kind of have to flip around, right? In order to have a voice there. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that there are people who thought about this, but I don't know what the language actually is about that. That's, that's a good question. Check it out on, on, um, on the website and see, and see if they, and, and ask the question there and see. Um, you can also look up these bills. That's really easy too. But you'd have to weed through a lot of it, right? It's a, it's pretty verbose. So um, over here and then up there. Yes. I was just going to say one way to account for that is to not count the primary, but count the general election. Oh, it may be that. It may be that the general election. It may be. But gosh, it's easy to miss one too, right? We all have lives. Like, did I flip it back or not? I don't really need to to vote in the general, and you know, it makes it difficult. I have a friend who's a newspaper reporter, and she changes her party every year. One year she's a D, and the next year she's an R, and she just flips back and forth, um, which is an interesting way to kind of address the issue uh, that's there. I guess she does. She's asking for it, right? You asked for it, right? You're the one that's flipping party. It's the system that's broken when you think about it, right? Uh, over here and then here. Yes, sir. Could you explain the problem we're experiencing right now with getting these pieces of legislation out of committee? <sighs> It's a problem, it's a huge problem, and it doesn't seem like it's gonna be going away anytime soon. And I think one of the reasons is because people are very safe in their seats. So you can have one member of the state legislature in a, commi in a committee that says, you know what, I'm just not gonna bring this up. And there it sits. And then he gets all kinds of pressure, or he or she gets all kinds of pressure, but it doesn't mean anything because they win all the time. So it's, it's almost a catch-22 then, isn't it? That that becomes part of the problem. Now that's my thought on that. Um, it could be also that maybe the leadership doesn't want it to go anywhere. And it's fine to be able to vote for something if it's never gonna go anywhere anyway, right? As they always say, follow the money. Follow the money. The money goes oh. to maybe move to amend. So is fair districts looking to target representatives and the senator with uh, SP22 to target their districts to force those so to get them out. I do know that there's an upcoming strategy session within fair yeah, districts. Excuse me? I don't know what team, so I can answer this. Okay. Um, I'm also on Susquehanna Valley Progressives who's hosting it. Oh, okay. But that's okay. Go for it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so last week or the week before, we launched a campaign to specifically target Daryl Metcalf. He is the chair of the state government committee in the PA House. Uh, he pretty much has cart blocked to block this bill. Um, so the campaign has started. Uh, he gave an interview, I think it was two weeks ago, where he said, gerrymandering reform isn't on my radar. I'm not hearing about it from anyone. Um, and this is despite the fact that 97 of his colleagues are co-sponsor on the bill. So he's not hearing about it. Uh, so Fair District sent an email out to all of our supporters, which is 11,000, somewhere around there, to start contacting uh, Representative Metcalf about uh, gerrymandering. So he hears about it. So he hears 11,000 people contacting him that we hear, you know, so he hears about so it. So after a couple days later, after he started getting bombarded uh, when we started our campaign, he got, you know, thousands of calls per day. Uh, he clarified a statement saying, well, I didn't hear about it from my constituents, which is not true because we, we have a group in this district, so it's not like there's no one doing it. 
It's amazing what you don't hear when you have your fingers in your ears. I know, I know. Um, that's that's what, what you, you and said exactly what he said. And for those of you who have tried to contact your legislator before, you may have run up against issues like uh, some legislator will say, well, the legal wound vote is suing us right now, so we can't talk about it. That's not true. Uh, Carol has consulted uh, constitutional lawyers and attorney lawyers, people who are experts on, are experts in the law. That's not true. Uh, another excuse I've been hearing is that, oh, well, this process is going to be biased towards the type of people who pay attention to government. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah. That's great, right? I heard that Ooh, one. Shame on those people who actually pay attention to government. You know, it's, it's not going to be representative of people who are not really, who don't understand government. Uh, and then the, the latest one I heard, and I heard this one yesterday, was that some senators are now telling their constituents, well, if we make this change, then we won't be represented anymore. And this is uh, specifically from rural representatives. So this is a new one I've heard. Senator Baker and, Sen and Representative Fritz have both told their constituents. Baker who signed up? No. Senator, Senator Baker has not signed up. So a lot of you have Senator Baker as your representative. Uh, she had told constituents either late last week or early this week that she doesn't think this bill allows rural, represent, uh, rural population to be represented in the Independence Commission. Now, if you saw the slide there, it, of course, says one of the things is that the commission has to look like Pennsylvania geographically, right. uh, culturally, uh, demographically, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yes. So um, their stance is really about what was outlined here in and aligned with the Senate Bill 22 and House Bill 722. So I don't know how far away from those statements they get into in terms of um, their stances on, on those aspects of things. I think that they're really focused on what they want to see in the legislation in order to make them more fair. Um, and so there was another proposed bill at one point that was coming up and um, they, although, and they made a statement on it that said that although we think uh, uh, that it's certainly better than what we have and that, um, and that there were elements that they liked about the bill, that it was still the politicians who were involved in it, so therefore we can't support it because it didn't meet one of their main criteria that we shouldn't have politicians deciding who vote for them. So that might be an example of that. Um, I don't know that they've had statements specifically for those, for those but, um, but I, I think what they're really trying right now is to get this to move through there and, and focus on these key elements that they see as um, being critical parts of, a, of districts drawn more fairly. So a good question, yeah. Um, yes, sir. Uh, on a slightly different note, I would just like to know what your reaction is to another type of gerrymandering that we see here in Missouri County, and that is no district, like the county council. We have 11 councilmen. Most of our local school boards are like that. They're all at large, and I see this as a mechanism for the parties in control to control the whole process without having separate districts. Yeah. You know, it, it's, to me, I call it you know, gerrymandering in a different setting. Have you any position on that? Well, it's frustrating, first of all, isn't it? And it's almost, it's almost, um, and I, I guess the, the really challenging thing that I see is the apathy that surrounds it. You know, I, and I'll use another example. I was looking at some numbers for people who were on um, party committees, and they got one in two votes. And that's how they got on. So in other words, they decided they were going to run. They got themselves on a ballot. They voted for them and maybe got a friend to do it as well. So you people sitting in these parties who have had one and two votes, how do you address that? You run. You run. When you repeat something, it gives it emphasis. You run. And that's what you need to do. You need to run for office. You need to run for office. The people who are in this room care about their community. They care about their vote. You care about your community. You care about your vote. Um, you know, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but um, you know, if, if, you, uh, if, if you allow that kind of thing to happen, that's what you get. 
That's why if you think the problem's outside of yourself, that very thought's the problem. It's tough, but um, but that's what you end up with. Um, that's what you end up with, and it's it's really really challenging. So. Um, so I guess my, my overall reaction is it's frustrating. It's, it's difficult, but that doesn't mean I shy away from it. I, I'm very politically active. In response to your question, amend the county charter so that we have districts instead of that council. And to do that, you need people in, in positions to do that. That's true. You have to get enough people to uh, put pressure on council to adopt the amendment or you put pressure on council to pass a resolution to create another government study commission, which will have been the third since, 90, since 2000, um, to do precisely what we're suggesting here, creating districts to elect members to council. Yeah. Hey, you know what? You, you've been, thank you for all these questions. This is really good. I can see that you're really engaged. I don't know if anyone wakes up in the morning and says, you know, gerrymandering's my thing. You know, I'm, oh, you do. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> he comes with the big cutouts, you know, of course you do, which is good. But, but you know what? I really appreciate Here we are on a weeknight, you know, on a rainy day. School just started, and you're here to hear about gerrymandering, and I think that that's amazing. So I want to give you a hand. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. So there's a petition for gerrymandering. I'm going to turn it back over here as well, right? Okay, yep. Well, first I'd like to say thank you to Dwayne. That was really, really, really good. Thank you. And maybe now, like I was way back when I went to my first informational session, you might be a little disturbed or concerned or angry or appalled. I, that word really was what happened with me. I was really appalled. And um, about uh, maybe you're concerned or angry about, as I was about the politicians deciding the district lines and doing it in ways that benefit themselves, looking out for themselves. You may be concerned, like I am, about health care, immigration reform, our current budget crisis here in Pennsylvania. And as Fair Districts co-founder Carol Cunningham once said, and it's, it struck me, and I believe it's a truth, she said, pick your issue. Until we fix gerrymandering, we are not fixing anything. And when I heard that, I said, yeah, I think she's right. I think she's right. And I've looked at that quote and thought about that quote many, many times. And I, I work full time. I work part time babysitting my grandchildren. Like many of you, I have very little extra time but I feel that I need to use my time and energy to help this cause because I believe in it. And I believe in, in the, that it, this is a truth, I really do. So we the people of Fair Districts Pennsylvania want change. Join us in saying no more. Join us as a member of the new Luzerne County group. Join us in the effort for redistricting reform. How? Well, when you came in there was a form we handed you to fill out and you would put your email on it, name and phone number, and I'll be in contact with you. To let you know, I'll email you. Our first meeting will be October 5th, Thursday. It will be 6.30 to 7.45 in the Hoyt Library in Kingston, and we'll go from there. And I have one other, uh, two other quick announcements. One action response you can take right away when you go home tomorrow. You can call Representative Metcalf the information was on this forum on the way in. You know, we don't have information out there for Senator Fulmer on Senate Bill 22, but Senate Bill 22 is in his state house committee, and uh, you can look him up online and, and call their office too. You could write to either one of them and uh, let them know you'd like to uh, see these, ho the House Bill 722 and Senate Bill 22 get a hearing and go to hearing. Yes, Can Shane. Can you the time and place of the meeting? It's uh, the first meeting will be Thursday, October 5th, 6.30 to 7.45 at the Hoyt Library in Kingston. Thank you. And uh, the League of Women Voters of the Wilkes-Barre area uh, has a flyer out on the table and they wanted me to share this information. They're having a Luzerne County Council Forum Thursday, October 19th at seven, from 7 to 8.30 
at, and the location is the Buckingham Performing Arts Center at Wyoming Seminary Campus on North Sprague Avenue in Kingston. And the public is invited to attend this forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters to meet and learn more about the candidates who are running for the Luzerne County Council and their viewpoints. So this flyer is also out on the table. Uh, I hope that I see some of you at the meeting. I look forward to working with you in this effort, this much needed effort, and I wanna thank you again for taking the time to come tonight, and thank you again, Dwayne. Great.